So uh, Joshua chapter 17, I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, uh, the first part of Joshua 17 again is just dealing with the historical account of dividing the land, primarily deals with the two sons of Joseph, um, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim um, and those two tribes and how God has allotted them uh, kindly together, if you will, a portion of the land. But what I want you to see tonight is, is what they res how they respond uh, to God's lot in which he gives them. And I want you to see that in verse number 12. So let me read a few verses together, and we'll go from there. Verse 12 of chapter 17. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in, the la in that land. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxed strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joseph, saying, or Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord has blessed me hitherto? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word, and Lord, I just pray. Lord, you'd use this text to help us tonight, uh, Lord, to uh, be a, a source of, of, of examination for our life, but also a source of help for our life tonight. And Father, just glorify yourself and how you speak uh, through this passage tonight. Lord, just empty me of myself, and Lord, speak, for Lord, we need to hear from you. And Lord, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do and how you do it, in Jesus' name. All God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, um, what I want us to look at tonight is these two tribes, the Manasseh and Ephraim, are, as I said, the sons of Joseph. And, and because of that, they have a pretty rich heritage in regards to Israel. And, um, and sometimes a rich heritage can also build into a life, a life of pride or an attitude of pride. And, uh, and that's what happens here. Now, as we deal with this, remember the, the divisions of the land were God's, God's provision for these different tribes. And so as God's providing for these different tribes, God has set the course of the division of the land. Now what he's done here is he's took, and he's took the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the center of the land, and, uh, and then he forms the, the lots of the land around circumference in a circle to the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because the presence of God is always in, to be in the center. And if you notice, the tabernacle is, is, was designed the same way with Moses. You had the tabernacle that sat in the center, and then all the tents of the 12 tribes were encircled around the tabernacle. And, and it's a picture to us that you and I need to remember that God has to be the center of everything that we do and everything that we are. And so he's doing this again as he's dividing out this land, and as God is giving out this inheritance to these tribes of Israel. But now with Manasseh and also Ephraim, there becomes a difficulty in this. And, and I want you to see a couple of things that take place here. And again, we're drawing this uh, analogy of, of the land of Canaan being for us the fullness of the life of Christ. And I think we have went through enough scripture to show that that's what it is truly meant to be uh, for us in the New Testament believer. And so as the fullness of Christ, I want you to see this from that light. And in verse 12, what we have is we have the disobedience of the people. Now, what is the disobedience? Well, it says they could not drive out the inhabitants. Now, this is the cause of their disobedience. They could not drive out. Now, obviously, when we read that, we read that and we know that um, from the proper perspective or the spiritual perspective, that's not a true statement. Because what did God say? Everywhere I send you, I will give you the land. It's already been given to you. And you can and will drive out the inhabitants. But here's that balance between position and practice. You and I have a position with Christ that is one with Christ. But the practice of it is you and I have got to live in obedience and in faith to Christ to live out the reality of all God's provided for us. And so this was where we have the disconnect. And so we have a cause of a disobedience here because now Manasseh and Ephraim have decided to, if you will, not trust God 
and entrusting themselves, all of a sudden now they're unable to drive out the Canaanites. Now, what I want you to see is this. Whatever it is in our lives that keeps us from walking in fullness, if we trust the Lord to take care of that, then guess what? We'll walk in the victory of it. But if we trust ourselves to take care of that, I promise you, you'll fail 90% of the time. Because you and I are unable to take care of those areas of our life that are keeping us from walking in fullness. Now you say, well, how do you know it's disobedience? Well, Ephesians, or Exodus 34 says this, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. And sure enough, when we get to the book of Judges, we find out with this very tribe, uh, the Canaanites literally began to take authority over Manasseh and Ephraim because they began to let them dwell with them and then eventually they took authority over them. Now the picture of that is, uh, is with us is every little area of our life that would grieve or quench the Spirit of God in us that would keep us from walking in fullness, you and I need to be careful because there's a tendency about our humanity where we'll say, well, you know, I, as, long as, as long as this is all that's in my life, I'm okay. Well, can I tell you, when we do that, we're automatically building within us a barrier that's keeping us from the fullness of Christ and walking in that fullness of Christ. And, and the principle is that God wants to root out every area of our life that's keeping us from his fullness. And God wants to root those things out every day of our life. And that's the reason God keeps showing us these things day after day after day after day. Because God's wanting to root those out. Why? Because God is, is, is wanting us to stay under conviction? No, God's wanting us to walk in fullness. God's wanting us to walk in blessing. But the only, only reason we don't walk in blessing is because we don't let God do the work of conviction. And, and so this is what's happened. They, they've disobeyed God. Now, to dry, bring this over to a New Testament principle, here's some verses that we can apply to ourselves in the same light. Using the Canaanites as a picture of the world, the Canaanites as the picture of the enemy, here's what uh, Paul would say to the church of Ephesus. Have no flesh or no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In other words, don't let anything in your life or don't let anything remain in your life that in any way, shape, or form would cause you to not walk in all that the Lord Jesus has provided for you in himself. Don't let anything stay there. In, in, in 1 John, John said it this way. He, he said it, uh, Love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And, and we're to not have any uh, ability in us to have those things stay in our life. I tell people it this way. To walk in holiness is to literally first have a mindset of distaste for sin. What God has to do is retrain our way of thinking. God has to bring us to the place where we despise sin in our lives and despise sin in general. And when we do that, then we become more open as God shows us those areas of our life. And then we become more open to let God deal with those areas of our life. And then all of a sudden, faith begins to kick in and we find out we have the victory in Christ Jesus over those areas. And then we begin to walk in, in, in the blessed fullness of the Lord Jesus. And that's what God wants all of us to do. I, I remember when I was growing up, um, y'all may find this uh, uh, um, not to be true, but it is. I got in trouble every now and then. <laughs> and, uh, and when I'd get in trouble, sometimes I would, you know, dummy me, I'd argue with my parents. You know, and I, I mean, you know, you all done that when you were growing up. And you, th you thought you knew the better answer. You thought you knew the better way. And I'll never forget what my mom and dad always repeatedly told me. We know what's better for you than you do. And I sit there, I remember as a kid and as a teenager, I'd say, how do you know what's better for me than, than, me, than I do? But in reality, they did know what was better for me. And therefore, they disciplined me and they corrected me when I would not do as they said to do. And what their heart was and their mindset was that if I became a person or a, a man that would come under obedience to them as parents, 
then I would be a person or a man that would learn how to be obedient to the Lord and then I could walk in maturity as an adult and not in sin as an adult. Now here's the thing. The Lord Jesus has made this great provision for all of us. And the great thing about it all is God will do anything and everything to get us to the place where we walk in it. Why? Because he knows what's best for us. But he has to root these things out of our life. And, and Manasseh literally did not see it this way. They literally did not see it this way. Now, notice the second thing, the complacency in their disobedience. Because to let the Canaanites dwell in this land, the bottom of verse 12, was just complacency. They knew what God said, but they thought they had a better way. They knew what God said, but they didn't think they could do it. Now, again, to think they couldn't do it was to take their eyes off of what God said he would do. And, and so now they're walking in their own way of thinking and the own energy of their flesh, and now they see the Canaanites as a great uh, number of people, as a, uh, if you will, giants in that area, and they saw them in a way where they now saw them as people they could not defeat, and so therefore they compromised, and they said, well, we'll just let them dwell with us, and by letting them dwell with us, we will subdue them, but not conquer them. Now, I want you to get that. Because this is what we try to do with our sin sometimes. Instead of dealing with the root of our sin that caused our sin, we want to deal with the fruit of our sin, the actions of our sin. We try to subdue our sin, but we don't want to remove our sin. And, and so, listen, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross just to deal with the fruits of our sin. He died on the cross to deal with the root of our sin. The very thing that caused us to sin is what Jesus became on the cross and took up on himself on the cross. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin, singular. Plural would be the fruits. Singular is the root. He became our sinful flesh. He became, he took up on himself that Adam nature in which you and I had. And he bore it on the cross. And he bore it on the cross. And the very root of our sin, we can have victory over if we just trust him. Now, is it a day-by-day -day thing? Yes. Are we, are we going to occasionally fall back into the realm of the flesh? Yes. But listen, you and I can have that victory over the very desires of the heart that causes us to sin if we'll just trust the Lord. And so instead of conquering the enemy, they compromised with the enemy, and they were complacent with the enemy, and in their complacency, they allowed them to dwell, and by compromising, they said, all right, here's what we'll do. We'll subdue them, and even though we're strong, and, but we think they're strong, what we'll do is we'll put them to tribute. And the word tribute means we will tax them by causing them to labor for us. In other words, we'll put them to work as a form of a tax. And we'll subdue them. We will not give them any authority. We'll not give them the ability to take control of the land. We'll have control of the land. But we'll let them live. We'll let them dwell among us. And we'll just use them to our advantage. Now, here's the problem. You, where did they learn that from? You remember back a few chapters earlier when Joshua didn't ask the Lord of what to do with, with the, the one tribe that traveled and said they came from a far distance? And so Joshua allowed them to be a part of Israel and be servants to Israel. And even though God in his mercy and his grace ended up working that out and using that for the benefit of Israel, still it was Joshua's sin and not asking God that brought that about. And Joshua could not reverse it because two wrongs didn't make a right. And now all of a sudden, what's the consequences of that sin? Now Manasseh said, well, we'll do the same thing with the Canaanites. Y'all got that? I mean, listen, it, 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 we do this all the time. And so now they begin to compromise with the Canaanites. Now, so here's the thing. So now they're living in a land that was meant for just them. And now they're living in a land and it's them and the Canaanites. So what do they say? Well, we need a bigger land. Now all of a sudden because they compromised and they were complacent and they disobeyed God... Now, all of a sudden, they become dissatisfied. And isn't that the way it works? I've always found when I get the most dissatisfied is when I'm the most out of the will of God. 
Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. When, when I get dissatisfied, I don't see that about myself all the way. But then after God begins to show it to me, I look back and I say, well, no wonder I was aggravated. <laughs> you, you know, it's amazing what happens. Why? Because, listen, when you're not walking in the fullness of God and you're not walking in the fullness of Christ, I promise you, your flesh is living itself through you. And now all of a sudden, I promise you, nothing will please your flesh. Because flesh is always self-absorbed, where the spirit is always God-centered. And, and so all of a sudden there becomes this disruption within you. Now watch, watch what this dissatisfaction caused. I, I, I just I find this fascinating. In verse number 14, we see the complaint, the complaint. Notice what it says. And the children of Joshua spake unto Joshua, "Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit?" It? Seeing I am a great people. Now, here was their complaint. We need a bigger lot. We need a bigger land. And, and they said, you've only given us one lot. Now, here's what will happen. When you begin to walk in the realm of your flesh, you begin to compromise with the things in your life and don't root those things out in your life. The first thing it will do is affect your discernment. And all of a sudden, you'll begin to see things as if they are, even though they're not. Now you say, what has that got to do with this text? Well, they complained to Joshua, you only gave us one lot. In reality, God gave them three lots. And not only three lots, but if you'll look at the history of it, the land in which God gave Manasseh and Ephraim is the land that literally was the most fertile land and geographically was the largest land of all of the 12, of the 12 tribes. But now all of a sudden, they didn't see it from that perspective. Now, all of a sudden, they were looking at it not from the perspective of what we have, but they were looking at it from the perspective of what we don't have. And they became dissatisfied. You ever done that? You ever had that time in your life where you just begin to look at things not from the perspective of what God has done, but what you think God should have done? And, and that's just a telltale sign for us that we're not walking in, in that fullness. There's something in our life that we've, we've compromised with. There's something in our life that through complacency we've allowed to remain in our life. And so they begin to complain. They begin to complain. Now, the amazing thing is their complaint was about their size of their land, and the reason they were complaining about the size of the land is because they still let the enemy live with them. And you say, again, why would they let the enemy? They forgot God was their victory, not them. And by the way, you know what Manasseh means in the original Hebrew? Forgetting. Isn't it amazing? Their very name is the way they lived. They forgot about the Lord. They forgot about what God said. They forgot about the promises of God. And I want to tell you something, folks. When we don't deal with these things in our life, this will become a repetitious pattern of our life. And if you read through the rest of Scripture, you find out when Gideon came to be the great general of the people, guess what? It was Ephraim and Manasseh that came and began to complain to Gideon. Because why? They didn't feel like they had a big enough part in the battle. And then when you go on, you find out it, Jephthah, they complained to Jephthah. And then when David became king, you find out again, they complained to David about their lot. And what happens is it becomes a perpetual lifestyle of motion. Why? Because they just wouldn't drive out those things in their life and in their land that they should have. And it becomes something that becomes systematic to our lives. It, it's systematic. It begins to happen over and over again. Let me give you an illustration that may help you with this. It's kind of like somebody, I used to own a restaurant. And um, when I owned the restaurant, um, how do I say this in a very polite way? If you think you can make everybody happy having a restaurant, you're nuts. <laughs> Amen? And, and I mean, people complain about anything. I mean, it was amazing. I and mean, when we had one lady that complained because there was no sweet loaf on the table, and then when she got up to pay, we found out her purse was full of sweet and loaf. I mean, people complain about anything. But here's an illustration that may help you of what, what Manessa's doing here. Let's say you had a plate of food in front of you, and the plate of food in front of you was sufficient for you, 
And you didn't complain about the plate of food in front of you. You were complaining about the second helping of food when you hadn't even made the first helping. That's what they're doing. God gave them plenty. All they had to do was obey God and let God drive out the enemy, and they would have had plenty of land. And so they were complaining about the second course when they hadn't even took care of the first course. And that's what we do sometimes. We, we, we just have this mindset about us sometimes that allows us to walk in this. Now, notice the contempt, contempt in this dissatisfaction. What was the contempt in it? Well, the contempt was towards God. Because literally in complaining to Joshua, they were saying, God, your lot for me was not good enough. See, it was one thing to complain to Joshua, but their actions were speaking louder about what God did. Because remember, Joshua wasn't the one that divided out the land. God did. Joshua was just the vessel that told the people what God said. And, and so there was a contempt to this. In other words, they were complaining, God, my lot in life here is not good enough. You ever been there? I have. Listen, I've been there before. And, and it's a miserable place to be. But listen, folks, remember this. God knows everything, and God's got everything in control, and God's got everything under his care. And I promise you, whatever God does and whatever God allows and whatever God orchestrates in our life, I promise you, as the Bible says so clearly, it is for our good and it is for his glory. And we just need to trust the Lord in that. And that's hard for us. That's hard for our humanity because the eyes of our flesh do not see the outcome, do not see the end result. But God sees everything as if it's today. And he knows the today just as he knows the tomorrow. And tomorrow for him is still today. And so what God does is in the realm of how he sees things. And we don't have that ability. And listen, God don't give us that ability because if God did give us that ability, I promise you, as hard as it is for us to trust God now, it'll be doubly hard because we just forget about God. And so that's the reason our only hope is to trust Him and to walk in faith in Him. And, and they didn't see it that way. They, they literally had this contempt about it. Now, here, here's the amazing thing. Notice the ironic thing versus what we looked at last week in chapter 14. They're complaining about their lot because they say the Canaanites are living there and they can't drive them out. But Caleb says, give me this lot because it's where the giants are and God's already won the victory. You see the contrast? You think it's accident that God put these things so close together in this? It's amazing how in, in 14 you have the story of Caleb and here in, in 17 you have this. And, and now all of a sudden you see the great contrast between the two. Now, note, notice this with me. Here, here's the other thing. Notice the claim in their dissatisfaction. They said here in verse 14, they said, seeing I am a great people. Well, what a claim. <laughs> I, I mean, where did they get this from? Well, listen, they were from royal heritage. And, and you remember, it was, it was Joseph in which God used to bring Israel to the place where they could literally go into the land of Canaan. It was Joseph that, that, if you will, brought Israel together as a nation. It was God that used Joseph and his position at the right hand of, of Pilate to be able to do these things. The royalty in which their heritage was. And their father was of royalty. And Joseph was considered, and even today, is considered a savior in the eyes of Israel. Because of what he did. And so they're saying, listen. Joshua, you don't understand. You forgot something, Joshua. We're, we're big stuff. <laughs> we deserve more. We're claiming our rights right here. Because our heritage warrants that we have better treatment than this. Y'all ever been there? Y'all ever seen somebody that thought they were something? Y'all been Baptist long enough. Say Amen. I mean, they think they're something. And they start claiming their rights. Well, here's the great truth about you and I as children of God. Now, this may bust some of y'all's balloon. Y'all love me, say amen. Y'all promise, say amen. You don't have any rights when you became a Christian. You have privileges of grace. The Bible says you became the dwelling place of, the, of God and therefore because you became the temple of the living God that you're bought with a price and you're not your own anymore. 
You don't have rights to make your decision. I don't have rights to make my decisions. I have become a purchased possession of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And listen, whatever lot he gives me is gloriously okay. But they claim their rights. We're something. We're something. Y'all see the pride? I mean, the pride just oozing out of this complaint. We're something. We need to be treated better than this. Now, listen. The, the best place you and I can get to is to remember this. That if Jesus didn't do what he did for us in salvation, then we would get what we really deserve, which is eternal separation. And if you always keep that perspective, then you'll understand that as long as Jesus has birthed you from above and you're born again, anything else is just icing on the cake. And so anything else is just gravy. And if you keep that perspective, boy, it helps us. And you say, is that biblical? Yes, because even Paul understood this. David understood this. David said of himself, I'm a worm and not a man. And Paul said of himself, I'm the chief of all sinners. He realized that if it wasn't for what the Lord done in salvation, he realized who he really was. And so anything God done was just gravy. But see, Manessa and Ephraim forgot this. Now here's the last thing, the confidence in their dissatisfaction. It says, for much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto. In other words, he's, they're trying to teach Joshua that God has special favor on them above all the other tribes. And because of that, because of their heritage, God is honor, supposed to be honoring them more. Well, number one, God gave them the biggest part of the property. But see, it was their disobedience that caused the dissatisfaction. It wasn't what God did, it's what they didn't do. Y'all with me? Now you see this all through Scripture. Adam and Eve. Who did Adam blame? Eve, but more specifically. Yeah, he said, God, it's this woman you gave me. <laughs> Amen? Now was it, you know, was it God's fault? No. But see, Adam blamed God. I mean, you know, it, you go all the way through Scripture, you find this time and time again. And, and, and so now all of a sudden, here we see this, this, these two tribes, they're dissatisfied in every way. Well, what amazes me about this passage is how Joshua responds to them. I, I say it this way, Joshua called their bluff. And, and look with me at verse 15. And Joshua answered them, if thou be a great people. Notice he didn't acknowledge they were. He said, if you are who you say you are, then get thee up in the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. In other words, they're only living in a portion of the land in which God gave them. Only one lot of the land in which God gave them. They didn't want to go to the other portion in which God gave them because the Canaanites they couldn't drive out and in the other portion there was the giants in the land. And it was a wooded area. And it was causing them to have to labor. It was causing them to have to really trust God even more than, than the Canaanites. And so now all of a sudden, here's what they do. What Joshua does is he rebukes them and he says, all right, if you say you're a great people, this won't be nothing but a thing for you. <laughs> I don't know why God does this, but he calls my bluff all the time. <laughs> Amen? Maybe he don't do that to you, but he does me. You know, I, I, I don't know how many times I get in my mind, this fleshly mindset, I've got this one. And God says, all right, let's see you do it. Amen? And then all of a sudden, about two weeks later, I'm crying out to God, and I say, God, I need your help. He said, well, I never left. Where you been? I mean, we do this all the time. And God calls our blood. Joshua said, all right, if you be a great people, go up and cut the wood down in that country, drive out the parasites and the giants on Mount Ephraim, and if, if that one lot is too narrow for you, God's giving you more. I mean, God didn't give them more because they complained. God had already given it to them. They just didn't want to do the, what, they didn't want to trust God to drive out the enemy. And so what's their response to this? Look at verse 16. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they and all in Beshean. Beth, uh, and, and the her towns, and they who are in the valley of Jezreel. So what was their excuse? 
their response is this. They say, Joshua, you don't understand. You don't understand. We need bigger land because we can't drive out the enemy because they got iron chariots. Now, let me agree, they still ain't got it. Now, listen to me, folks. I'm going to make this as practical and as simple as I can. I don't know how many times I've had um, over the years as pastor, people come to me with, with different um, areas in their life or different, um, you know, maybe addictions in their life. It may be situations in their life, um, sin in their life, whatever it may be. And, and I'll say to them, well, here's what God's Word said for you to do in this situation. And they'll say, well, preacher, I know, but I, I just can't do that. And what they're really saying is they don't want the consequences of their sin, but they don't want to deal with their sin. You all with me? I had a man come to me one time, had an issue with an addiction, and I told him that what he needed to do is go into his home and remove everything in his home that would, that would cause him to indulge in that, that specific addiction. He said, I can't do that. I said, so what you're really saying is you don't want to get victory. Y'all with me? Say amen. He said, no, I want victory. He said, but I, I can't do that. And I said, well, that's your only hope. That's your only course of action. And he says, well, you can't prove that biblically. I said, oh, I can. He said, where at? And I said, well, I said, Jesus said, if your if you're, if you're, um, eye offend you, pluck it out. Amen? I mean, listen, folks. The thing is, you have to be willing to do whatever it takes to, to get those things out of your life. Let me put it to you another way. What Joshua told Manessa was, go up there and cut them trees down and drive out the enemy. Okay? Picture it this way. What trees in our life are keeping us from walking in the plains of the fullness of Christ? What trees are, are standing in the way of our spiritual vision of what God has for us? And here's the question. Are we willing to take the axe to the trees by faith? Y'all with me? Y'all see it now? I mean, this is what Joshua was saying. And so their response was, was, again, disobedient. So what does Joshua do? Well, he reminds them. And notice how he reminds them. Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people. Now, wait a minute, Joshua, what are you saying to them? Are you feeding their pride? No. This is what Joshua was trying to get them to understand. You're a great people not because of who you are. You're a great people not because of your heritage. You're a great people because of the God that's already promised you victory. See, their mindset was they were great people because of who they were. What Joshua said, no, you're a great people because of who he is. And he says, you are a great people and have great power. Where's this power coming from? I mean, they can't even drive out the Canaanites. Well, Joshua was reminding them. Remember what God said. He said, I will go before you and I will go with you. And I will drive out the enemy. And then he says to them, he says, thou shall not have one lot only. In other words, reminded them, God didn't just give you this one lot where you've decided to just compromise with the Canaanites. He's given you these, these lots. And then notice what happens here. Notice the resolve of Joshua in verse 18. Joshua would not compromise with them like they did with the Canaanites. So here's what Joshua said. But the mountain should be thine. That's the mountain he talked about with the trees and the, and the giant. For it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine. For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. So what's Joshua saying? He says, no matter what you come up against, if you'll understand that your greatness is in the power of God, there's nothing you can come up against that God won't already give you the victory over. Isn't that good? Now you say, well, did they take his advice? No. 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 You say, how do you know? Well, listen to this verse. Probably one of the saddest verses I've ever read in, in Scripture. It's found in the book of Hosea, chapter 4 and verse 17. And here's what it says. It says, Ephraim joined themselves to idols. And God said, 
Let them alone. Let them alone. Let them alone. Over and over and over again, God provided for them. And over and over and over again, they would not trust God. And they compromised with the enemy. The enemy took authority over them in the book of Judges. The enemy led them to worship the gods of the Canaanites. They became an idolatrous people, always complaining about their lot with God. And finally God said, after many, many years later, he said, let them alone. Let them alone. And you say, well, preacher, God will never say that to one of his children. You're exactly right. But here's what God can do. He can call us home. Not let us alone, but he can call us home. And I don't know about y'all, but all I want is the fullness of Christ. Amen? And you say, well, preacher, this thing didn't speak to me tonight. Well, it spoke to me. <laughs> I got Paula, and my, Paula was here training the new treasurer secretary. I got her in the office. I said, Paula, pray for me. I said, I'm under so conviction. I don't know if I can preach this thing or not. <laughs> I mean, this thing, this thing rung my bell. And you and I need to understand that God will do anything to get us to walk in fullness. Why? He knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. Amen? Isn't God good to us? I'm glad God loves us enough to not leave us the way we are. Amen? I'm glad. Father, I love you. I praise you and I thank you. Lord, thank you for this passage. Thank you for this text. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would, we would learn by it. Father, I pray that, Lord, we wouldn't allow anything in our life to stand in the way of what you have for us. And, Father, we understand that day by day, as we grow in grace and knowledge, you're going to show us more and more and more. But, Father, as you show us, let us be a people that trust you to know that Jesus Christ is our victory over every, everything in our life that would stand in our way, that Jesus is the ax to the trees, that Jesus is the, the slayer of the giants. That Jesus Christ is the overcomer. And he is the conqueror. And Lord, we can be overcomers because he overcame. And we can be conquerors because he is the conqueror. And Lord, I pray we would grasp hold of that by faith. And Lord, we would cling to that by faith. And we wouldn't allow these things to be rooted in our life. And Lord, try to excuse them away or try to compromise with them. But Lord, we just trust you to remove them from our hearts and our lives. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do in it and how you use it. In Jesus' name.